you hear be in the name of God. Amen. So while I was on vacation, sort of a combination of things came together, articles I was reading in the newspaper, some other things that were going on. I just started contemplating personal responsibility. And it's sort of on again and off again during vacation, just several things that came up. A lot of it was in the news. And then as I prepared for the sermon, I, as I was reading the gospel, that phrase, be dressed for action and have your lamps lit, just leaped out at me. And it, it hit me, of course, that that's not a command that God gives to someone else on our behalf. It's a command to us, to every one of us, be dressed for action and have your lamps lit. No one's going to do it for you. Be dressed for action, have your lamps lit. So I want to talk about accepting responsibility, but I want to begin by ta telling you a story about how I began, I'm by no means uh, a perfectly responsible person, but how I began to take more responsibility for my life. And it, it started after my divorce in 1991. And in the aftermath of that, I was asking myself, what was it about me that went ahead and married a woman that God had told me not to marry? And I, I just have to be honest with you, he, had, he put up some serious roadblocks that I took detours around. And so I wanted to understand, what, what was it about me that did that? And I began to realize that through, my, through prayer and study and talking, that what I was thinking was, if, if I have a wife, I'll be a whole person. And as, you know, as Christians, it, it's understandable if you think that that's supposed to happen. I mean, the Bible says, after all, the two shall become one flesh. But here's what Scripture says, the two shall become one flesh, not two halves make a whole. You see, it's the two whole people coming together that makes one flesh. Now, if you knew that, praise God, I, if I did know it, I didn't pay attention to it, I really felt, felt that I was an incomplete person and I needed to have a wife. I needed someone who was going to help me feel or make me feel whole. And I talked to a Christian counselor for a year and a half. I went to a divorce recovery group at a big Presbyterian church in downtown St. Louis, uh, Missouri. Uh, understandably so, I, I didn't want to be around Episcopalians or my other colleagues in the diocese. I just wanted to go somewhere else. And I learned an awful lot, and, and God revealed to me, this is what he revealed to me, and I think it's true for any relationship. To the extent that you want or expect another person or other people to make you whole, to make you happy, it's a form of idolatry. Because you need to be looking to God for that. I learned that God wanted me to be so connected and so dependent on him for my sense of self that then I would be whole enough and well enough to give myself to someone else. And that I was responsible to be connected to him. I needed to do what needed to be done. No one was going to do it for me, not even God. I had to set about getting my sense of self from him. And the, I discovered the more you begin to take responsibility for your life, it, it actually begins to heal you up a lot. And then you can spot the unhealthiness in other people. Now at the time, 
that was really important because, uh, and I didn't date a lot. As a matter of fact, I think I went on two dates before I met Carolyn. But in both cases, I immediately recognized this other person as someone who hadn't grown up yet. Not that I was a perfect product, but I was learning to, learning to take responsibility for myself, and I didn't want to be with someone who didn't have that sense or that goal for their own life. So I met Carolyn, and I quizzed her. <laughs> I talked to her a lot. And, I, and I, it became clear that this was a person who had taken responsibility for her own life also. And it, it was life-changing. I have to tell you, it's just life-changing to realize that no one's responsible for my feelings, no one's responsible for my life except me. And that is God's desire for each and every one of us to begin to take responsibility for ourselves, to grow up in him. I learned that responsibility is an ability that you can learn. It's a way of responding to life in healthy ways. There are a lot of ways to respond to problems and opportunities and illness, depression, whatever, loneliness, all kinds of things. There are all kinds of ways to respond to that. There are only a few healthy ways to do it. And there's a lot of roadblocks that, that life throws in our path to keep us from taking responsibility. And the three I'll just name by title. You know, the rights mentality that people have today, the victim mentality that people have today, and the entitlement mentality that people have. All of these uh, stand and thwart taking responsibility for our own lives. So, I want to talk about two things. First of all, I want to give you some reasons about why you might consider increasing your own responsibility, why it's important, and then what to do about it. Why live responsibly? Well, two reasons. The first is it matters to God. And this is why it matters to God. Because the life of heaven has broken in to this world in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we've been invited by him and the rest of the New Testament to live into that new reality, to the life of heaven. Now think with me about this for a moment. Whatever else heaven is, it is a place where God's perfect will and justice permeate everything. Everything. And friends, that life is non-negotiable. You don't get to heaven and say, well, what about my needs? What about what I want? Uh-uh. It's God's will. God's will and justice permeates everything. And what makes me think that I can go through life having it my way, as Frankie said, and then get to heaven and think I'm going to like that or want that. I mean, right? I mean, think about that. You go through life and you want it your way. You think you're just going to wake up at the pearly gates, so to speak, and okay, well, I'm going to give that up now for eternity. That's why it matters to God, you see. It matters to God because we need to begin living the life of heaven here and now. Now, God has made it possible for that to happen by coming in the form of his son, dying on the cross, and he gives us his Holy Spirit to empower us and equip us to do it, but it is my responsibility to walk in that life. God is not going to do it for me, and neither is anybody else. And if I want to be prepared for heaven, I better be start preparing now. That's one reason. The other reason to live responsibly is because it matters to other people. And I think more than, than ever, it matters to people today. The people who are not here today, 
you know, the, the people who look down their noses at the church and have, don't want to have anything to do with the church, and there are a lot of good reasons for why people don't want to have anything to do with the church. The cynicism and skepticism that people have. They're tired of being told what to believe. They're tired, they don't really care about, you know, if they go to our website and they say, Jesus, you know, Christ Church is a church that believes in the Bible and Jesus and blah, 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 blah. You know, I've figured out that people don't really care about that too much. They want to see you live it. They want to see it in action. They might even participate in what a church is doing before they believe in it themselves if they see that that church is living out its values. It matters to others. Now, this should not come as any news to us. Because what did Jesus say? The world will know you are my disciples because you preach right doctrine. No. By this the world will know that you are my disciples because of your love for one another. In other places of scripture, Paul in Romans 12 and then again in Romans 13, Paul wrote, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Because we belong to the day, we must live decent lives for all to see. So it matters to God, it matters to others. It just frankly matters that I accept responsibility for my life. Now, how can I begin to live responsibly and take responsibility for my life? And the first thing, forgive the acronym, but it'll help you remember it. I have to accept responsibility for my PMS, for my physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. I have to accept responsibility for my physical, my mental, and my spiritual well-being. Now, the only thing I'll say about the physical side of things is this. There's a lot to say, but I'll just say, as long as you're able to move, keep moving. Right? I mean, everywhere I look, and, and I'm feeling it myself, the body starts wearing out, and things break. The, the, the mistake to make about that fact is to, to say to yourself, well, if I don't use it so much, it'll last longer. <laughs> Uh-uh. Keep moving. And with regard to our mental lives, I, I want to share with you something that uh, you're actually only the second group of people. The first group of people was at eight. That I've ever shared this with anybody. I've never told this to anyone. The only person that's known about it is my wife and family. And that is, uh, I was diagnosed with depression several years ago, and I've been treated for it for, for several years now, and I'm fine. But here's the thing about depression, speaking as one who knows about it firsthand. Depression makes other people sick. It really does. It makes all the people around you sick. It worries them to death. I mean, I, it hit me this morning. I can't believe it, it, this hit me only this morning for the very first time. What it was like, what was it like for Carolyn to listen to me as I would say things like, I'm not sure I want to live anymore. I asked her this morning. She said, it was scary. And it's not that I have control over the way my brain functions. That's not the point. The thing is, is that I wasn't doing anything about it for at least two years, if not more. I don't know exactly when I became aware of being depressed. And my depression, by the way, compared to a lot of people, was very mild. But I didn't do anything about it for at least two years. And that was completely, utterly, unconscionably irresponsible of me because it made the person I love the most sick of worry for me. I have to accept responsibility for my physical life, my mental life, my emotional life. Carolyn's not responsible for that. No one's responsible for it but me. That's what I figured out. And the spiritual side of things. 
What does accepting responsibility for my spiritual life look like, say, in the context of Christian community? Well, the analogy I, I think that would work the best is, again, from marriage. You know, communication is really important in marriage, obviously, and yet there are always people, couples, who expect their spouse to know without being told what their wants and needs are. Now, I'm not, suge I'm not saying that you have to constantly tell your spouse these things. You, you, know, you have to communicate them, but your spouse should have responsibility for remembering them. Okay? I mean, just let's be fair. I mean, my, your Carolyn told me I want you to remember my birthday. She only had to tell me once. And I didn't have to work to remember our anniversary because she deliberately chose May 1st, May Day, and I've never forgotten it. Uh, she said she did that on purpose. So, we have to communicate to each other and our, we have to communicate our desires and our needs and our hopes and our dreams to our, our spouse. And it's the same with church. To be spiritually responsible for yourself is to say that when you are sick or lonely or hurt, you call someone at the church. You call the office. When you're in, sick and in the hospital, call the church. When there's a death in the family, call the church. When there's an emergency or crisis, call the church. And we will figure out whose ministry will best help you. It may or may not be one of the clergy. It may be both clergy and lay people. It, it depends. There are all kinds of things that go on in people's lives. And the reason I don't like to be called father, by the way, is that it perpetuates this image that some people have that, the, that I am the only minister doing the only real ministry that counts anything. And that is, un, if this is a biblical church like I think we are, you need to know that is not biblical. That is, there is nothing scriptural or biblical about that kind of mentality. We are the body of Christ and we share the spiritual gifts of God together and together we minister to each other. And another part of spiritual responsibility is to accept with joy the ministry of other members of the body of Christ. It is to look forward to the ministries that we all share and receive them as ministries of God. If you need prayer, go to the prayer team. You have to, but you have to get up and you have to walk over there, <laughs> okay? And they will pray with you. If, if you don't want to do that in front of everyone here at church, I bet if you were to call Dick, is Dixie here today? I don't see Dixie, but Dixie or any, who are the other members of the prayer team that are here right now? I bet you could ask any one of these people, if, is there any chance we could meet during the week? And they would probably bend over backwards, am I right, to, to meet with him. So, but you have to ask. Just ask them. Take responsibility. So take responsibility for your own PMS, your physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. Secondly, you take responsibility for your life by directing your own reactions. Proverbs says, fools vent their anger, but the wise quietly hold it back. Now, the caveat I would say to that is, I, I don't think Scripture intends for us to not express anger. We express it appropriately in a godly way that is perfectly acceptable. I mean, it's okay to say, I'm angry. I'm angry because, bunk. So don't, I'm not saying stuff it. But I do need to think before I speak. Matthew 12, 36. Jesus said, and I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. I really don't like that verse. I wish God had left that one out. Because what I hear is, Ben, you're accountable for every careless word that's ever come out of your mouth. So if you want to be responsible, engage your mind before your mouth. Paul wrote in Romans 12, 21, conquer evil by doing good. 
One of the ways you show responsibility is by not trying to get even when someone hurts you. We live as Christians to a different standard, to forgiveness. That's our standard. Have you ever noticed that of all the pet issues that some Christians have, and that not that they're not important, you know, or sexuality, or abortion, or doctrine, or doing the liturgy the way I want, or whatever it is, have you ever noticed that no one is out there protesting the lack of forgiveness in people's lives? No one's ever standing up saying, we need more forgiveness in the world. I wonder why that is. The only reason I can come up with is because I know I'm the one that doesn't want to do it. I don't want to forgive the person who's made me angry. I'd rather make love to my anger. And I'm talking about myself. Okay, I'm, that wasn't a rhetorical thing, okay? This sermon is for me, friends. Okay, I'm trying to grow up here. <laughs> and, and I struggle with that. I get angry sometimes and I just want to be angry. And the Bible, God says, uh-uh. That is not taking responsibility for your life. I, go, I take responsibility third by guarding my mind. The wise person is hungry for knowledge while the fool feeds on trash. That's Proverbs 15, 14. Now, I don't think that you're going to be responsible for every idle thought that flips through your head. But I think we're responsible for what we choose to put in it to what we allow to go into our mind. Enough said. And lastly, I take responsibility. This goes side by side with forgiveness and controlling my reactions. I need to admit my mistakes. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. I'm not responsible when I go through life demanding justice for everyone else and mercy for myself when I want no one else to get off the hook, but I've got reasons why I do things. And so you need to make exceptions in my case. You know, it happens all the time. That, this attitude affects, it's everywhere. I'm reading an article about a bipartisan effort on tax reform, right? Uh, Democrat and Republican, maybe the only two who are actually trying to work together in, in, in Washington right now and they're talking to small business owners about the kind of things that, uh, you know, they, they're trying to work on for tax reform, and all of them are saying, oh, yeah, well, we think that reform is necessary, just don't get rid of any deductions that affect me. That is the attitude that permeates the society where we don't admit anything. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Like I said, you know, this sermon's for me, so I, I haven't said a lot for the last month, so now I'm getting it all out. <laughs> Sorry about that. No, I'm not. <laughs> these, are the, you know, these are the areas where I'm working on increasing my own responsibility in my life, and I, I know just because I know human life and human nature that many of you struggle with the same things. No one's going to do it for you. God will empower you with his Holy Spirit, but don't misunderstand what that means. It doesn't mean that God's going to possess you and change your personality and make you into something that you're not. The way the gifts of the Holy Spirit work, in my experience, is when you start walking, the Spirit's gifts kick in, but not the other way. When I start taking responsibility for my life, I find that the empowering, equipping presence of the Spirit is there to help me. But I have to walk. I have to take the steps. So it's my responsibility and your responsibility to be dressed 
for action and keep our lamps lit. Amen.